English mixed martial arts? I think, you know, England's a very, very hard thing to crack. There's so many sportsmen, there's so many celebrities, such a big celebrity culture in England. And it's hard, it's very, very difficult, even for like a boxer. There's a few boxers out there that has been around forever in England, they're very, very big in boxing, and it's hard to break the seal. I think you have to win a world championship, you have to have you know, a fight of your life and all those sort of things. So I think it's in the future for me, and I think once I have that performance that can draw people to it, um, then you can start talking and getting on the talk shows and being a face of it out there. But England's a hard market to crack. There's so many people out there, there's so many sportsmen out there, um, and I know the English people are behind me and they come to the events and they, they're really good. The fans are really, really good for uh, our sport, but there needs to be more. There needs to be more interest. And the reason there isn't more interest is because it's not as mainstream yet in the country. The, it's not the fighters' fault. It's the media that you guys are trying as hard as you can to push it. And we need more people to try hard and push it and keep pushing it and keep pushing it and it'll keep growing. So, so how would you rank uh, English uh, MMA comparing to other European MMA markets? I mean, as a market, as to, a, to as sell a it? Or? level co competition. Oh, a competition level? I mean, we're lucky enough to have had a lot more fighters get to the level of the UFC. I think England has had more than most of the European countries. It's sort of catch Sweden are catching up now. Um, so I think we have a little bit more experience at a higher level. When it comes to like technical ability and people coming through, you know, the Scandinavians are, I think they're well ahead of England, to be honest. Uh, their grappling prowess, their boxing, the way they, you know, I, I come to Sweden two, three times a year to train. And the way they train, the way they think, they think very differently uh, to England. So, and then you've got Russia, you've got Poland. Poland at the moment, the jiu-jitsu over there, they're producing fantastic jiu-jitsu yeah, practitioners. Always. Oh, there you go. Um, and they're, they're really going to come through with some monsters. And I think when the UFC, which is going to do this year, hopefully, or next year, going to you know, get that market, the Poland market, the Russian market, those guys are beasts. And when they come through into the UFC, we'll see a whole new side of the European MMA. So there's a lot more to come. I think at the moment, England is still flying the flag, but the fighters like, you've got Conor McGregor now from Ireland, you've got Alexander Gustafsson from Sweden, they're the big marquee names. And England doesn't really have one now. Bisbean is still there and he's still great, but he's not really making a run, he's not doing anything out there at the moment. He's kind of subdued and, and plateaued a little bit. And these guys that are coming through uh, are really leading it for, Euro uh, for Europe at the moment. And you saw, okay. I saw on social media that you were in the, in the States um, recently. So uh, how long did you spend there and what was that experience like? Uh, I was out in San Diego training at uh, Alliance Mixed Martial Arts for around three and a half months. I travelled around a little bit, went to a lot of shows, did a lot of stuff. Um, and I lived a life out there, to be honest. It was great. I, I've actually had a bit of problems back home with my, well, strange, but my family are moving to Spain. So I don't really have a home in England anymore. And if I came back and had my own home, but I have nowhere to come back to. Uh, my gym has disbanded a little bit. Not disbanded, but Tsunami Gym, my coaches, my teammates... They're all doing things, but in loads of different places now, and there's a lot of traveling involved to train. Um, and I don't have any big middleweights to train with in England. So I've always said I wanted to stay in England. I've always wanted to, you know, to train in England and be a part of England. And now I found that to elevate my game and to get to the next level, I need the training partners, I need the bodies, I need the people like Phil Davis, you know, wrestling with me every single day. And you just don't have that at the moment in England for the bigger guys. So I've made the move at the moment over to San Diego, and I'm living there pretty much full time now I, I go out after this event I'll be out there to train uh, for whenever my next bout comes up and you know that that's it I'm just gonna keep going live in the sunshine it's 24 degrees can't complain about that two hours from LA four hours from Las Vegas I mean it's it's I've been told by everyone I've met American wherever it's the place to live in America everyone every American wants to live in San Diego and someone today said to me I think it's the third best city in the world or something you know that ranking wise so I'm in a pretty good place as you mentioned before, you're still waiting for that breakout performance, someone that'll really push you into a spotlight. Yeah. What would you think would be your ideal uh, opponent next to your ideal fight? Someone who's going to bring it. Someone who's going to come, who's going to fight. I've had two two performances now where I still feel like I've won both fights. I Technically, I've lost them. Uh, my last performance, I mean, I wasn't happy with at all. Uh, I was very, very disappointed in my performance. And But the fighters I, I'm fighting, I just they have no challenge to me. I don't see much of a... I don't have a fear in them. I don't, I'm not worried about the fight, so I'm taking them, not taking them lightly in training, but when I'm in there, I don't have a different reaction. I, I've worked this out about myself. Uh, I say there's like three mindsets in the world. You have the lion, you have the fox, and you have the sheep. So the, the sheep is the follower that does nothing and just gets slaughtered. The fox is the clever guy who can disguise himself self as the sheep and be the lion, and the lion is the hunter. And whenever I am the fox and I'm fighting a lion, no problem. 
I can be the fox, I can be the smart guy, I can wait for them to attack and I can turn it into my, my way. As soon as I'm the lion and I've got to slaughter the uh, sheep, I'm starting to struggle. You know, that's the personality wise and in my fighting style. And that comes down to training, it comes down to my upbringing in the sport, the last seven, eight years I've spent, I've always been the underdog. I've always been the guy that people look at and think, ah, he's a tall, skinny white guy. You know, I could just grab hold of him and throw him on the ground. And in my mind, that's great. So I've been the underdog. Now I'm starting to become favorite. My last two fights, I've been the favorite, the odds favorite. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's changed. I've got to change my approach. So my next fight, the people I want to fight are challenges. I want to fight, I look at it as like the, Kel the Kelvin Gastelum approach. I'm very close to Kelvin. You see this guy, every fight he takes, he goes from, he's take, fighting Tyron Woodley and people are like, he's fighting Tyron. And he was like, just won a great fight, got to this huge stage, got in the top 10. I think he's ranked fifth now or sixth or wherever he is. I'll fight Tyron Woodley, number three. Now he's got another big challenge in front of him. His training is, gets better, his, his focus gets better. And, you know, if he loses, he lost to Tyron Woodley. The guy's ranked third in the world. So he has nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I think it's a great strategy from Kelvin. And I think he whoops Tyron Woodley next weekend. So. You know, I, I want that, I want the challenges, I want the things that make, the people that can bring the best performance out of me. When I feel like I'm dominant and I'm winning, you know, it's, it's not working for me at the moment. You had this goal to staying uh, undefeated before, of course, the last two fights uh, in your division. So you have a new goal uh, probably right now. I'm still undefeated. I just said I feel like I won my fights. I, I know they might want might not be great performances, but the Sean Strickland fight, it got announced by some media outlet as the third worst decision of 2014. I completely agree with that. Um, and I, I feel like I 100% won that fight and the guy ran away from me. My last fight, bad third round performance, I got a bit hesitant and I got caught. I survived an onslaught, I had a black belt on my back for three or four minutes, he couldn't get anywhere near me, I managed to stand back up. Very proud of that performance in that third round, but I was a bit lackadaisical. But I still think I won round one, round one and I won round two, so I won the fight. So I still feel like I haven't taken anything negative from those, like those performances, I moved positively forward and I feel like I'm undefeated. Well, I don't care what the stats say, and I don't care what, what... The thing is, as soon as you lose a few fights, or you lose a fight, people start to doubt you, don't believe in you, they think, oh, you know, yeah, he's, he's dropping off a little bit. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm better than I've ever been. I'm stronger than I've ever been, quicker than I've ever been. I'm training with more higher-level people than I ever have, and I'm in a different league now to where I was last year, and I just need to prove it now. So I need that performance. I need that performance to sweep all this under the rug and just to keep moving forward. So you're saying about this ongoing process of becoming more professional, uh, getting on the high, higher level, what did you get rid of uh, since you joined the UFC? What did you get rid of? Uh, bad habits, maybe bad things, or just things you did and you shouldn't do to, to become better? You know, I think um, there's a lot of things that have changed in my life. I, personal life and everything has changed, but just your approach, you know, for training, I used to overtrain a lot. I used to live in my gym. I lived, lived in the gym on the, on the mats for two years and I trained every day, three times a day, as hard as I could. I'd do sprints as hard as I could. I'd spar as hard as I could. And as you become more professional and you see the guys around you and you start training with the high level people, you realize you don't have to, it's a mental thing. You don't have to go 100% every single day because you're just wearing your body out and wearing your mind out and tiring you out. It becomes a grind. And now I'm looking for things to branch off into. So rather than grinding every single day at the same thing, trying to get, I'm getting inspired by different things and relaxing a bit more and enjoying my training. Right now, I haven't, I've done, been in, back in England for Christmas for the last six weeks and I've been putting a gi on doing jujitsu. And I've never done that before really in a gi. Completely new challenge, it revitalizes me, inspires me, I learn new tricks, and I go to training exciting to learn something new. You know, whereas before, you just be grinding, 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 grinding. I think that's one of the things you see with the, uh, the older fighters now. They're just stuck like, you know, like a hamster on a wheel, just doing the same thing over and over again every single day. And I think you need to change your approach, you need to look at new ins inspirational figures, think about, oh, I wanna learn how to do this now, I wanna learn how to do this technique. And just keep it fresh and keep it in, in, enjoying it. And I think that's the biggest difference for me in the past year. I know I'm a talented guy. I know I'm, I'm up there with the best guys and I can compete with them. I just need to keep growing and keep getting dynamic and, and keep feeding what I'm doing and then it'll all come into place. Luke, you said you want a challenge in your next fight. Is there any potential opponents, anyone you'd stylistically like to, to face? I, there is no one I, I can think of. And this is the thing, I, I'm not shy of calling people out, you know this, but in the division right now, I'm coming off of two pretty poor performances, pretty you know mellow performances. I don't like to be shouting for people's names and calling people. I said to Joe, whoever you want me to fight, I'll fight. Wherever you want to fight, I'll fight. I'm ready to go now. You just call out the person and I'll make sure that I run through him. So I want a challenge. I want someone who I know is going to come into the, and this is what I said to Joe, I want someone I know is going to come in there and he's going to throw down. Not a guy who's going to run away and start, try and score points. I want a fight. 
Um, my last two performances, like I said, have been a bit slow. But if you look at the performances I've had since I've been under the UFC banner, like from the Ultimate Fighter forwards, you know, I got a, people say it's a flying knee, a bit of a, like a hopping knee knockout against Gilbert Smith, uh, which was a great knockout for me. I had I was number one pick on the Ultimate Fighter due to my performance getting into the house, which people didn't really see, which was I still think one of my best fights. Then I had fight of the season against Dylan Andrews. I got knockout of the night or fight of the night, whichever one it was against Andrew Craig, fight of the night, I believe. You know, I've had, some, I had, I think it was the second highest exchange rate in a middleweight debut in the UFC against Colin Hart. I've had exciting, visceral, hard fights uh, my whole career, and I'm always willing to put it on the line. And the last two, it's been down to my opponents that I haven't been able to put it on the line, not myself. So, you know, I want someone who's going to come forward, who's going to going to throw down with me, and we're going to have an exciting fight. That's what I'm looking to do. You spoke about the Ultimate Fighter there briefly. Um, what do you think about the John Jones scenario? Uh, obviously, you are on opposite teams. What do you think about him testing positive for cocaine? Well, you know, who am I to judge John Jones? He's uh, likes to party by the sounds of it. I don't know, but he uh, he's a. I think how the UFC have dealt with it and how they have looked at it and you have a lot of discussions about you know marijuana how people have been banned for that and the cocaine and all this sort of stuff and I just think there needs to be a set decision for what happens if you get caught for this if you get caught for that if you get caught for that not case by case you know John Jones likes to party so it's okay it, I just don't agree with that I think there should be a rule set and I just think what it is is UFC had never come across it before, you know, they, it's not something that they've had to deal with and I don't think there's a thing in place for it, so I think they need to put a rule book in place, they need to stick by it, whoever does, whatever happens, you know, and treat it like a sport, uh, that's my opinion, I have no, I mean, me and John aren't, aren't like best mates, we don't really get on, like, or even on the season, I'm obviously, we all know I'm pro chael you know, and we talk about drug abuse and so we can go on forever with this conversation, so let's just kill it, but... I'm pro chael I always have been, and John always rubbed me up a little bit the wrong way. Um, so, you know, I, I think he should be punished a bit more than he has been, but, you know, that's, unfortunately that's the sport we're in.